There, Facebook's been doing really weird things recently. Part of it it's, is... I can get like one step further further in the prompt now where it's like, oh, make your post and title your video. So all your complaining work, Emory, we are good to go. Okay. We're on? Unless Facebook's lying to me, it's been known to do that. Yeah, yeah, mine says we're on too. Oh my gosh. Hey, hey, all right. Let's get it. Um, let's Oops. get it. Get it shared out to where it needs Up to on go. Our pages. Um, if anyone is already listening, thank you for being patient. Um, so we're we're finally on. We so are. People, people can see us. We are fashionably late to our own <laughs> online event, but better late than never. So it should now be on the Historians on Tap Facebook page. If you're not watching on that one or the Loudon Museums, they should all be up and running in just a second. Um, as we get started, as folks are starting to tune in, um, I can introduce some of our speakers tonight. Um, so of course, I'm Anne-Marie Paquette, Director of Education with the Mosby Heritage Area Association. Uh, we have with us also from the Mosby Heritage Area Association, Travis Shaw, our Public Hello. Programs Coordinator. We also have uh, the Director of the Latin Museum, Dr. Joe Rizzo, in the house, in his house. We're all in separate houses. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have a special guest tonight, Dana Shope, who is with Civil War Times. Um, Hi, everybody. And has been showing off some of his artifacts that he has here in his office. So uh -huh. we've been having a great show and tell. Um, but tonight, of course, our main topic is 1861 hit wonders. Um, Joe, I don't know if you've got it. Do you have Come On Eileen lined up? I we forget to do that. I that song lined up. Um, <laughs> So not written in 1861, but thought it'd be fun to kick off tonight's program with a one-hit wonder. We've um, been so tonight, for 25 minutes waiting for this to go live. So we forget. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about some unique incidents that happened in 1861, um, some of which were kind of a flash in the pan, what we might think of as a one-hit wonder kind of thing, other things which had long-reaching consequences. Um, of course, 1861 being the beginning of the Civil War, a lot of our stories are going to be, you know, along those lines. Um, but there should be fun stuff here tonight. Whether you're a Civil War buff or just bored at home and looking for a drinking buddy, we are here for you. Um, and I guess, do we want to go around and say what we're drinking tonight? Yeah, I should say what we're going to talk about, too. Yeah, okay, okay. So uh, let's go in order. Travis, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, as Anne-Marie said, I'm Travis Shaw with the Mosby Heritage Area Association. And uh, tonight I'm going to be talking a little bit about a naval topic in 1861, and specifically Confederate attempts to blockade the Potomac River. Um, so I hope Rob Orison is watching out there because I know this is a topic near and dear to his heart. So I um, <laughs> hope I don't mess it up too bad, Rob. Uh, tonight I am drinking a beer from Aslan Brewing, which is in Northern Virginia. They've got a few locations and this is called Business Showers. It's a pale ale and it's pretty good. I like it. What about you, Dana? Well, I, I didn't realize there was a local brewery theme. And so I'm actually drinking the last beer in my house. So I'm nursing it. It's, I gotta make a run tomorrow. And I'm just drinking Sam Adams Boston Lager, but I've dressed it up in this fancy tin tavern mug, you know, so I can, hoist this up uh, as we're talking. I'm, I'm just like, surprised you're not drinking Iron City. Come yeah, on. Yeah, well, <laughs> Travis is, of course, making a cut at me because I'm from the Pittsburgh area, which, of course, is the greatest region of the United States. Uh, but no, I don't have any Iron City that's right a hot take alarm. Yeah, that's yeah. a hot take. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I just have just a uh, base old uh, Sam Adams Boston Lager. It'll do. What are you going to talk about, Dana? I'm going to talk about a very sort of unsettling incident along the Potomac River that occurred on July 21st, 1861, the same day as the Battle of, of First Bull Run, when uh, there was an interaction between civilians and northern soldiers along the Baltimore-Ohio Railroad line. And it's an early interaction in this border area. It doesn't end well. Um, and it's, it's 
you know, it's it's very unusual. I really, I really feel as though we could have made the subtitle for this program. It doesn't end well. It doesn't end well. You know, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every story we ever tell. Me. It doesn't okay. end well, right? <laughs> what about you, Joe? So I am drinking from Bear Chase out in Bluemont, Virginia. Uh, one of my favorite breweries. I am drinking the Seven West Maybach, uh, and I'll probably be drinking after this one, Mr. Pink from there. But I appreciate it. They're super easy to order online and go pick up. So they are open, I think, most days of the week. Nice. I am going to be talking about Senator and Colonel Edward Baker at the Battle of Balls Bluff. And spoiler alert, he's going to die. Um, so it also doesn't go well for him. It does not end well. It changes uh, how Congress observes and studies and conducts the war effort uh, following the battle and his death. So I'll get into that briefly. Very nice. Um, I'm drinking Gold Ox from Old Ox Breweries here. Um, and I know that both Travis and Joe have been able to go and actually pick up curbside service um, from their breweries. Um, but there are also a number of crackers you can get at the grocery store, which is where I got Golden Ox too. So keep an eye out, even if you are not able to get out to a brewery or to a winery, there may be some that have distribution in your local grocery store and you can still support those local businesses. Um, tonight, I will be talking about a second lieutenant from Massachusetts who also, spoiler alert, dies um, at Ball's Bluff, um, but his death has some larger pop culture um, ramifications that we'll talk about too, specifically with an actual one-hit wonder song that was written at the end of 1861. Um, so before, um, before we get into it, does anyone else have any last minute remarks? Yeah, I do. So uh, since we had to kind of do a change in terms of how we're sharing it, uh, we're still monitoring all the comment sections. Uh, it just won't necessarily show from the Loudoun Museum in terms of the responses we give. Uh, but still definitely let us know what you're drinking uh, and questions you have. We're watching it. Andrea's behind the scenes checking that out. Uh, so if you have questions, again, feel free to always put those in the comment section and we'll try to add those in as we go along. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, let us know what you're drinking, where you're tuning in from. You know, same as every Thursday. We want to make this a kind of a tradition. So at least yeah. as long as we're stuck inside. All right, Travis. Make All right. It so. I'm leading it off. Okay. Like I said, I'm going to be talking about a naval topic tonight, um, which I know is not as many people are fam as familiar with the naval aspects of the Civil War. And uh, hopefully not everyone is familiar with the topic I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, now, as I said, we're going to talk a blockade. And when we typically think of blockades in the Civil War, I think most people think about the United States Navy blockading the southern coast, you know, cutting off the South's trade with foreign powers, you know, cutting off the cotton trade, um, keeping goods from coming in and out of ports like Charleston and New Orleans, Mobile, and so forth. Uh, but tonight I'm going to talk about kind of the, the opposite of that, and that is the Confederate attempts to blockade the Potomac River and to cut off the city of Washington from the outside world. Um, this is going to begin very early in the war, pretty much as soon as Virginia secedes. Uh, Virginia forces and later Confederate forces are going to start making plans to do this. Now, of course, the Confederacy in 1861 really doesn't have any Navy to speak of. There's no way they're going to be able to pull this off with naval vessels. Uh, so what they're going to do is build fortifications along the Virginia shore uh, with cannons that are going to try and interdict any shipping going up and down the river. Um, and as I said, this is going to start very early. One of the early champions of this is actually Robert E. Lee. Before he's put in command of, of any Confederate field forces, he's a Virginia, you know, commander within Virginia's army, I guess you could say. Um, and so he's going to oversee a lot of this construction. Um, the first battery is built a little bit outside of our heritage area down in Aquia, along Aquia Creek. Um, but within a few months, there's going to be batteries dotting the Virginia shore along Prince William counties, um, you know, their riverfront, places like Freestone Point, Cockpit Point, where Quantico, the Marine Corps base is now. Um, there's going to be batteries all the way down, as I said, Aquia, Matthias Point, um, basically anywhere where the river gets narrow enough and there's like a nice bend in the river that's going to slow shipping down. They put these batteries up with the hopes that they're going to be able to blast any shipping out of the water. Um, and this is actually pretty strategically important during the first few months of the war because Washington 
You know, they're trying to rush as many troops to Washington to protect the city as they can. They're trying to rush all this war material, weapons, ammunition, and so forth, um, as well as the day-to-day -day needs of the people who live in the city. You know, food, coal, firewood, things like that need to go to the city. And at this point in time, in the spring of 1861, there's only one railroad that goes into the city. So a lot of that cargo is coming by water. And if the Confederates can cut that off, they're going to really impede the Union war effort. Um, they're going to cut off communications with the outside world. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is a tremendous embarrassment for the Lincoln administration to have the city of Washington just completely cut off from the outside world. Um, so they erect these batteries. Um, technically, they're under the jurisdiction of the Confederate Navy, and I say that like, you know, very, <laughs> very generously to the Confederate Navy. Um, but a lot of the men who are actually manning these fortifications are new soldiers. They've never done anything like this before. A lot of them are infantrymen, so they have no experience with cannons. Um, so the actual effectiveness of, of this blockade is debatable. <laughs> Limited. Um, yeah. One, one captain actually talked about how his crew was like terrified to sail up the river and come under fire. So he stops his ship in the middle of the shipping channel and the Confederates fire 84 shots at him and are unable to hit his ship. So, well, what, do you know what kind of, of cannons they had or where they were getting them from? Um, great question. Uh, there's a lot of mention of like old howitzers that they're, they're doing yeah. now in uh, awesome. one yeah, um, old naval guns that they found, um, either from like shipyards and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, again, like I said, I think it, it's a, a combination of poor equipment and poor training at this right. point. They probably don't even have the right ordinance to hit, yeah. you know, stuff, yeah. Right, um, but regardless of the actual effectiveness, it's a tremendous psychological issue. Um, mm -hmm. I said in the city of Washington, people are freaking out. You know, you, we know how rumor travels, especially in, in bad times nowadays. Um, there's this fear that like the city will be cut off mm -hmm. and like shipping. There's a lot of ships that are afraid to go down the channel. The Navy says we are no longer responsible for the safety of anyone going up and down the river. Yeah, uh, so yeah, it really, really comes to a head uh, in the summer of 1861. And it falls on one man who kind of brings it upon himself that he's going to break this blockade. And he's a really cool guy. With, I, I love talking about him. His name is James Ward. Um, Ward, he's a Connecticut native. Um, he's got over 40 years of Navy experience. He's, you know, fought slave traders in West Africa. He's fought pirates down in the Caribbean. He's fought in the Mexican War. Mm -hmm. He's actually one of the founders of the Naval Academy, so a really important figure in U.S. Navy history. Um, beginning of the Civil War, he's sitting around Washington Navy Yard, or excuse me, not uh, New York Navy Yard, New York Navy Yard, and he is like itching for a combat command. He wants to get in the fray, and so he writes to the Secretary of the Navy and proposes what he calls the Flying Squadron. Um, this is like a, a quick-moving strike force that he's going to create that is gonna lift the blockade of the Potomac River. So he collects every ship he can. Essentially, they start impressing civilian vessels. His flagship, the, um, the Thomas Freeborn, is actually a, a tug, a New York Harbor tug, <laughs> that they slap some 32-pounder cannons on. Really fast runner. It's good, good yeah, like very, very 1861. Um, like let's just very take whatever floats, slap yeah. guns on it, and just send it to battle. Um, so he takes this little fleet of like tugs and survey ships and harbor vessels, sails out of New York, and they arrive in the Potomac River. And like I said, his mission is to blast these Confederate entrenchments into submission. Now, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way um as i said it doesn't turn out well yeah no, not, not, none of our stories turn out well tonight um they go into action june 1st um they get they try to hit that confederate battery at aquia creek and you know this bombardment lasts hours you know his ship the thomas freeborn a few other ships kind of circle around the river lobbing shells at this confederate entrenchment the confederates are firing back i think they fire for like four or five hours at one another 
And true to form at this point, um, some of the Navy ships get hit, but there's no serious damage. No one gets hurt or anything. Um, the Confederate losses are, are even less. Um, the Confederate commander actually says they lost one horse and one chicken killed in this bombardment. But it, was, so but it was the but it was the best chicken they had. Right. It yeah. was the best chicken. <laughs> I should mention that a lot of the Confederates involved in this action were Texans, um, part of Hood's command, who would later go on as like having the reputation of some of the best fighters in the Confederate Army. But it's not a very auspicious beginning for them, or at least, you know, they're better infantrymen than artillerists. Well, they had to fight better after that. I mean, they lost their chicken. They lost their chicken. It's all in revenge. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> so this this flying squadron or Potomac flotilla, as it becomes known, um, just keeps this up over the next few weeks. They're up and down the Potomac River. They'll, they'll fire at Confederate camps, Confederate entrenchments. Uh, on June 27th, 1861, they make a concerted attack on the Confederate battery at Matthias Point. And if you pull up a map, Matthias Point is right where the Potomac River makes like this real, real acute angle. It's like almost a 270 degree angle. So any ships passing through there are half the slow. And so this is like the major bottleneck. If he can take out this entrenchment, this fortification, the river should be clear. So they send Marines and sailors ashore to destroy these entrenchments. They run into Confederate infantry. They're chased back to their ships. And as they're being chased back ashore, they come under heavy, heavy Confederate small arms fire. Lots of rifle fire, um, some artillery fire. And they're looking at their fleet off in the river, wondering why they aren't firing back, why they're not getting any covering fire. And as it turns out, very early in the action, uh, Commander Ward, you know, the guy who put this whole flotilla together, he's actually personally sighting the 32 pounder. He's laying along the gun, aiming it at the Confederates, and he's hit in the stomach with a Confederate rifle ball. Oh. And so he actually is laying there on the deck, gut shot, bleeding out. That's um, not going to end well. No, and everybody Great. basically like panics and is like, looking after him instead of returning fire against the confederates <laughs> and so um the the expedition at matthias point is a complete and total failure uh, but the only man killed in this expedition is commander ward um, yeah. he, he dies from his wound and he becomes the first u.s navy officer to be killed in the united states civil war and that happens right there in the potomac river and a chicken and, and the chicken, and chicken. But the chicken was a confederate so <laughs> um so just as like a quick epilogue to all this that confederate blockade is going to continue through the fall um and into the winter of 1861 um ships will occasionally try to run the gauntlet run through the river um there's one account of a 69 year old african-american captain a guy named daniel myers who i want to learn a lot more about because his story sounds awesome um, he actually sails his schooner, the Susquehanna, from Alexandria down the river, runs the gauntlet of Confederate batteries um, unscathed. Several other ships will follow along, do the same thing. Um, but the flotilla is never able to knock out any of these Confederate batteries. They'll try again in January of 1862. They attack Cockpit Point in Prince William County. Again, it's an inconclusive fight. What finally breaks the blockade is actually the Confederate Army, um, not, not the US Navy. Uh, in March of 1862, Joseph Johnston, the Confederate commander in Northern Virginia, orders his army to move south towards Richmond. And so those entrenchments along the river will be abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, the Potomac Flotilla will land and like blow them up and destroy them to make sure no one can ever use them again. Um, but that blockade is finally broken. So for several months, just the presence of these few little kind of, if forgive me for saying this, kind of half-assed Confederate batteries, you know, struck so much fear in the city of Washington and provided so much embarrassment for the Lincoln administration. I think it's kind of a fun little story. Um, and if you go to Prince William County, go to Lee Sylvania State Park, um, which is near Woodbridge. It's a great park. And you can actually go and visit the Confederate battery that's there. The entrenchments are still there. They have some cannons shut up, set up to show how they operated. But it's a really cool little site, um, kind of a forgotten piece of our local Civil War history. All right, Travis, maybe Dana, uh, 
Hey, Drew. Drew Gerber's got a question. Get into hey. The uh, yes, there is a Civil War trail sign at that site. <laughs> there <it> is. <laughs> Drew wants to know, what is the preferred service charge for a three-inch ordnance rifle when targeting at 700 yards? Oh, that's a Dana question. That's... No, that's 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 a Drew trying to show off question, and of course, <laughs> I don't have that answer at hand. I don't have uh, a clue. Uh, two point five pounds of powder. Obviously, I believe that. Sure. There you go. I think the answer is to get Drew in on one of these things and ask him a really specific, yeah, difficult question. What's the average time for installing a Civil War trail sign in the rain? <laughs> So before we go, I want to raise my glass in honor of Commander Ward, as I said, first Navy officer to lose his life in the Civil War. So Ward, Ward. Yes. here we go. Now, but Travis, that, that's an interesting, really, that's an overlooked story, that Potomac blockade. But, you know, you think about it, uh, the Confederacy did break their own blockade when they had to withdraw. And that was sort of the problem they had in microcosm. They couldn't hold the rivers. You know what I mean? Mm. They lost the Potomac River line, and later on, they can't hold the Rappahannock River line either. Yep. You know, they just don't have enough manpower. Even though that blockade was effective, you know, they can't hang on to it. It's not. It's not a long-term solution. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of also makes me think about the effectiveness of of the U.S. Navy's blockade on the South. You know, one of the reasons why Ward has to use like these tugs and right. survey ships is because every other ship in the Navy is being forced to blockade thousands of miles of coastline. Like every bayou, yeah. every creek, every you know possible little landing spot in the Confederacy. Um, it really was an amazing task that the Navy was able to achieve. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Hmm. I think you're up, Dana. Yeah, Dana. Well, um, this is going to shift to back to the land, but involve water to some extent because the action, the incident I'm going to describe takes place along the Potomac River. And it's kind of interesting. About a year ago, I think I was perusing some various uh, dealers, Civil War dealers on the internet. And I saw this one who had for sale. Uh, the heading was July 18 once, 1861 statements of four men who witnessed a murder of a civilian investigated by William F. Greeley, first New Hampshire volunteers at Point of Rocks, Maryland. And I live in Maryland and Frederick County and Point of Rocks is in Frederick County as well. And it's right on the Potomac River. If you live in this region, the Route 15 bridge goes across the Potomac right, right at Point of Rocks. And it's known today really mostly, I think for it's really pretty train station that's there, but it's been on the, the B&O for a long time. So, I was really intrigued and the, the document wasn't that expensive for Civil War stuff, so I purchased it. And this is what the original looks like. I'm gonna, I don't know how much you can see of it, but it's on uh, that, that wonderful Civil War era paper, uh -huh. that rag paper they had that holds up so well. And it's written in this very fine penmanship. Uh, and it's the testimonial of four men and it was taken down by Lieutenant William F. Greeley of the 1st New Hampshire Volunteers. Now, the 1st New Hampshire was part of a small brigade of three-month regiments. These regiments were all formed up in May of 61, and they're going to be discharged in August of 61. Commanded by Colonel Charles Stone, that's going to be a part, I think, of Joe's story later about Ball's Bluff. So Stone is ordered to take these four regiments, the 1st New Hampshire, the 9th New York, the 1st Pennsylvania, and the 4th Battalion of DC Volunteers. Uh, and these guys basically sort of wander up and down uh, the Potomac River shore in what is modern Frederick and uh, Montgomery County, you know, kind of marching back and forth. And eventually, they are ordered, they, they were in the Frederick area for a while. They were at the Monocacy Aqueduct near where the Monocacy River empties into um, the Potomac. And then they're ordered to march down the CNO Canal towpath to Point of Rocks, Maryland. And they arrive there in early July. So they're there, at least a portion of the regiment is there, the first New Hampshire, I should say, uh, throughout July and they're there 
a portion of the regiment is there through July 21st, the same day as the first battle of Bull Run is fought. Now on that same day, and I just can't get over this, you know, this, this first major battle of the war is raging, what, 30 miles south or something like that from, uh, you know, Point of Rocks. And there's these working men basically are leaving Sandy Hook, Maryland on a handcart, a, a railroad handcart. You know, those things you pump that you see. Yeah. Cartoons. Yeah. Yeah. In cartoons. So they're pumping this handcart and there's about eight or nine guys on this handcart. And I don't know what they were doing, how they, what they were doing as labor in Sandy Hook, but uh, they, they, most of them lived in the vicinity of Adamstown, Maryland. So if you drive north on Route 15 from the Potomac to Frederick, what do you think, Travis? Adamstown's about halfway, right? Not even. It's, it's pretty close to Point of Rocks. A little it's, closer to Point of Rocks. Yeah. Okay, so that's where these guys live. And a spur of the B&O goes pretty close to Adamstown, and the, the tracks are still there. Yep. So that's their destination. Now, they've probably made this trip a number of times, right? And they admit in these testimonials that they all had been drinking. One of the testimonials is by a Curtis Wheeler, right? They've all been drinking. We've all been drinking. This isn't gonna, this isn't gonna end well, is it? <laughs> um, and um, as Curtis Wheeler's statement, he said, uh, we had drunk three times of whiskey and two of beer. <laughs> we yeah, all drank I'm... several times of whiskey and beer before we saw the soldiers. So in essence, these guys are going home, cranking along, and they run into a picket line of the first New Hampshire, okay? Now, based on what I have seen or have read, first New Hampshire hadn't really encountered anything dangerous to this point, right? Um, but they, they run into this picket line of soldiers and an altercation breaks out. The New Hampshire soldiers, want to commandeer the push cart and take it from these guys. And these guys argue and say, no, this is ours. You're not gonna take it from us. And there's one particular mouthy guy on the push cart named Samuel, Samuel Calvin Lamar. There's always one of those. Yeah. Maryland. Right, yeah. So Lamar is um, uh, 19 years old at this time and um, I'm drunk. That's a good drunk. age to do something stupid. 19, yeah. drunk, <laughs> right. from he, Maryland. He, he's 19. And so an altercation uh, breaks out. And a soldier in the first New Hampshire named Samuel Webster pulls out his, his revolver, perhaps similar to this one I just happened to keep on my desk. Which, uh, which unfortunately, is a one. <laughs> this is, it's, it's, it's a new model Remington, oh, but it's, it's broken. It's, I gotta get it fixed. So it's not gonna harm anybody unless I throw it at them. But um, he pulls out his revolver and he fires it at a man named Thomas Harwood. Hmm. One of the men on the push cart, he fires it, but he misses, okay? Fires off a shot. Things calm down a little bit and, um, you know, and then the altercation picks back up and Lamar, is on the push cart at this time and he says shoot and be damned webster threatens to shoot him samuel webster the new hampshire and, and lamar says shoot and be damned you don't scare me webster <laughs> shoots lamar through the head and he drops dead on the ground that Just would one, do it one I mean, shot and that would do it and lamar and, and lamar is dead so of course when this happens the lieutenant commanding the picket line named William Greeley, who I mentioned, rushes over there, places Webster under arrest, and then he's going to sit down and take the affidavits of four men that were on the push cart. And I won't, they're all too Four drunk men on the push cart. They're, they're, yeah, they're basically... Um, Let's not forget uh, the yeah, muzzle bottles of whiskey. Right. So he said, you know... Uh, uh, he takes the testimony of these four guys, and they. I'll read you just uh, a portion of one by John P. Crown of Adamstown, okay? And he says, I'll just pick up here. The soldier then fired, and Lamar fell on the left side of the car. I then said that we must take the car down to camp and get a surgeon, meaning the push cart. 
when the soldier said, let the son of a bitch die. Whoa. Ouch. Uh, I shot him because he did not obey my orders. Previous to the shooting, Lamar, the, the soldier had also shot and fired a man named Thomas Harwood and missed him. The soldier who shot Lamar was drunk. I think that Lamar was drunk also. So, you know, this is sort of a common He's refrain. Drunk. You know, both sides think the other is drunk. The, and these guys on the push cart basically admit that they were drinking. So, you know, here you have these guys from New Hampshire, and it's easy to villainize them, but they're from New Hampshire. And now they're along the Potomac River, and you can look across and see Virginia. And they're in a very alien environment. And you have these young men who are used to doing what they do. And all of a sudden, there's martial law thrown in their face, right? So it's a very uneasy situation for all of them. Interestingly, in 1890, um, someone that was a member of the regiment actually published a regimental history of this little three-month first New Hampshire, OK? And they mention this incident there. And they say, we marched six miles down the Ceno Canal towpath to Point of Rocks, Maryland, a dirty Secesh village. So, who won a rock? Yeah, they're sort of predisposed, right? And the, not, and then before the shooting takes place, a day or two, Stone tries to get served at a local uh, bar or restaurant or hotel, I should say, uh, the St. Charles Hotel. He tried to get served, and the proprietor denied him service. Oh, he got served. He did, because Stone ordered the, the building taken over under martial law, and so it was occupied. So these the do, what's that? Then he had all the drinks he wanted. Yes, all the drinks he wanted. So these guys, right, they're sort of predisposed to, you know, see these local civilians as the enemy because of this stuff. And then there's this push cart incident, and they mention it in this um, regimental history. Here occurred the unfortunate conflict the only one of the kind during the campaign in which a young rebel was killed by a pistol shot by, fired by a soldier named Webster. They call him a rebel. Yeah. He wasn't a rebel, right? If you just read this, you'd think, oh, a rebel. He's a 19-year-old kid on a push cart. He, he, hadn't belonged, he didn't belong to any army. Um, and so Webster is arrested. He's held in Frederick. I know that... Um, Travis has a man crush on Jacob Engelbrecht, <laughs> the, uh, the Frederick County diarist who kept copious notes throughout the war. And Engelbrecht mentions this in his diary on July 22nd. <laughs> there we go, man. Yeah. I was using it to prop up my computer, actually. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, sure. He carries it all the time. Yeah. You probably just drink that business Hello. showers beer and look at that and think it. Anyway. So, um, Dream. so it, Jacob Engelbrick writes in his diary on July 22nd, 1861, at 4 o'clock p.m., uh, killed Calvin Lamar, some, uh, son of Benoni S. Lamar, was shot yesterday near the Pointer Rocks by Samuel Webster of Company B, 1st New Hampshire Regiment, stationed at the Pointer Rocks and along the Potomac. He was 19. And in parentheses, later on, Engelbrick goes back and writes, Webster had his trial November 12th, 1861, and was acquitted. So he got away with it, basically, uh, which is not too hard to believe. So, you know, here's this ugly incident. And then if you follow the careers of some of these people, it's also interesting. OK, so John Crown was one of those who gave testimony. Mm -hmm. Crown will later enlist in the Confederate Army. OK, I don't know exactly uh, what unit he's in, but there was a draft record in Frederick County, and on it, it's, they try to draft him, and it says, in the Rebel Army, he was captured September 15th, 1863, and he spent, he was a captain, so he, he was sent with other officers and spent some time at Fort McHenry, and then was transferred to Point Lookout Prison, and Crown is from Adamstown, Maryland. They're all from Adamstown area. Charles Brady, is another man who gave testimony. He joined Elijah White's uh, Comanches, 35th Battalion, Virginia Cavalry. Uh, Thomas Harwood, the man, there's not a testimony from him, 
but he's shot at by Webster. Harwood also joins the 35th Battalion, White's Comanches, and he will be captured at Brandy Station. So you wonder if these guys are predisposed or this incident sort of pushed them to cross the river and join a Confederate army. Webster himself will go on, the first New Hampshire dissolves in August of 61. Webster then enlists in the seventh New Hampshire as a sergeant. He will be discharged from then and then that unit and then will join the first New Hampshire heavy artillery. He dies of disease in February of 1864. Wow. That's his service record. He doesn't survive the war. Uh, the William F. Greeley, the officer, actually resigns you know, his commission when it, the third is mustered out in August. And then in September, he joins the regular army, which I find very interesting. He had no previous military experience, but he joins the 11th United States Infantry. And at the Battle of Peebles Farm, near Petersburg on October 1st, 1864, he suffers a gunshot wound in his face to the right eye. And that will cause him problems after the war. And I can't remember the exact date, but he's living, I think it's in New York. And one day he just walks out the door and his family doesn't see him again. After the war, he had mental issues. So, um, you know, and then Samuel Calvin Lamar, this is interesting to me, um, I actually found his grave and his grave is in an abandoned cemetery, uh, on the uh, road between pointer rocks that goes over to, oh gosh, do you, where does anybody know where South mountain creamery is up there? Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's, it, what's that road, Travis? Is it, you turn, you, you, you basically turn off 15 at pointer rocks and go down that road. Lander road. No, it's not Lander. Um, um but there's an abandoned cemetery. Heidi, my wife, Heidi, found a register for this guy. And, and there's an abandoned cemetery there. You drive down a lane and all of a sudden you see headstones on your right in the middle of the of woods. It's this abandoned, like, Hollywood movie set, creepy cemetery with sunken graves, 18th century graves. And at the very edge of it, there's a grave, the Samuel Calvin Lamar, July, death date, July 21st, 1861. I know where we're all going once this is over. Creamery? Uh, I want to go yeah. check that out. I could take Sounds it right back creamery. to it. I would actually like to get something started to try to preserve this cemetery. Cool. It's in a section of woods in the middle of farm fields. And mm -hmm. that's where Lamar is buried. Probably, pro and, and from where he's buried, you can see the spur running to Adam's tent. Cool. He's probably buried, perhaps within sight of where he was killed. Wow. And so, you know, it just, this is something I, you just stumble upon. And, you know, most people don't learn about this stuff. You, of course, you think about First Manassas and everything, but this sort of epitomizes this border area along the Potomac. Issues like this, yeah, this, this, issues like this occur all the way through the war, you know, raids back and forth that, you know, it just, a, it's almost, um, you know, a Vietnam-esque kind of scenario, right? You know? An, an invading army in a hostile territory and you know these unfortunate incidents happen so um that's sort of the underbelly of 1861 aside from all the recruitment hoopla and you know the the fancy uniforms and everything else you know here you have you know a young guy that's basically murdered and you know it's perhaps hard to even blame the soldier for what happened he, he probably was scared too you know and wasn't sure what was going on yeah, and you make a good point where when people think the Civil War, they typically break it down by the battles. Right. Yes. Manassas, Second Manassas, Peninsula Campaign. Like there are months and months and months between a lot of these battles. And that's really where the true story is, especially like where most of us live in Northern Virginia or on the Potomac area. Right. And these people in Point of Rocks and across the river, they had to deal with this for four years. You know, yeah, the same thing on the Virginia side. I mean, there's murders that you know, yeah. gray areas between murder and killing and war. Yeah, there's all these back and forth and you know i mean this is you know disrupts their lives forever but for four years it had to be just you know i can we maybe relate more now than ever we're stuck in our houses right you know we're afraid to go out because there's an unseen enemy out there but you know you can imagine if you're pro-confederate person in point of rocks and it's under union martial law right you might be yeah. fearful when you leave your house we're a pro-union person 
in Lovettsville under Confederate martial law. Right. You know? like, yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Or a teenager know. just trying to drink some whiskey on a rail cart. Yeah, right. I know. And you know, yeah. that's kind of what this boils down to, right? A young kid had too much to drink and got himself killed, you know? Dana, do you know how old Webster was? That's, uh, I was I, wondering the same thing. Yeah. I, I, I do know, um, I did know, I should say, if I've got some notes here, I could flip through. He's not a very old person, okay? That's he's, what I was going to guess, is that this was all, this was basically a peer yeah, he, situation, yeah. you know? I don't know if I've got his service record here or not, but he's not like some old guy. He's, um, he's in his 20s. I may not have it right handy. But I, I do remember he's not very he's not very old at all. Yeah. I think he's early twenties. That's that's a really great story too because that whole area of Point of Rocks and Adamstown is really kind of at the fault line in Maryland that you see kind of where pro Southern sympathies kind of start to give way to pro Union sympathies. Yeah. Because you look at a town like Brunswick that's just a few miles west and that is like hardcore pro Union. You look, you know, city of Frederick generally is like more pro Union. Well Any place north and west is yes. but Adamstown, you know, a lot of whites Comanches come out of there, Point of Rocks. Um, well, you know, and White himself was from Poolsville. Right. right. He wasn't just from Loudoun County. He's good a point. Maryland boy. So the yeah, idea that point that his neighbors or you know folks from that community would have would have joined the confederacy i think that's that's part that makes sense yeah it's... i should have maybe just briefly elijah white is if you don't if folks don't know he's sort of like a a minor mosby i guess you would call him uh that has a band of raiders that you know maraud around northern loudon county and um they they're at points attached and detached from the army of northern virginia they fought with the Army of Northern Virginia at Brandy Station, but often they were detached on their own. And um, I've read other soldiers' diaries about when they move through this area that they they worry about Elijah White, yeah. and, and he's buried in Leesburg. Yeah. Um, and um, but you know, um, yes. Oh, one last point. So before they came here, you know, as I said, they kind of these this Stones Brigade was up and down the area. They were in Frederick for a while, and they loved it there. You know, they were well treated there. So I think coming from Frederick, that's pro-union to this little village on the river where you could see Virginia, you know what I mean? I think they feel like it's an entirely different atmosphere and it's hostile and, it, you know, they're, they're not among friends anymore and they're going to be a lot more on guard. Yeah, it's amazing how much of a difference just a few miles here and there can make. You know? Right. That's a really good point. You know, and, like the difference between Leesburg and Waterford during the war is right. tremendous. You know, because Waterford's very, very pro union, correct? Very Quaker yeah. town. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm glad that, that Stone was involved in that story because Stone, of course, plays a very big part, you know, in, in Joe's, Joe's tale that won't end well. Yeah, the story I wanted to tell is not about Stone, but he's involved. And yeah, it doesn't end well for him at the end of this. Uh, but I wanted to focus on Edward Baker. And when I moved to the area, you know, I, was, I live near Balls Bluff. It's in Loudoun County. I wanted to get to know this somewhat smaller battle uh, in comparison to some of the other, other large ones. And so to me with Bakers, I always like to look at politi political ramifications of war. Uh, so this story, what happens with him definitely fits within that. He's got an interesting life the more you look into it and you keep reading that he was good friends with Lincoln. And whenever I hear that, I'm always like, okay, is this someone who like Lincoln's hand and then all of a sudden it's sensationalized. Next thing you know, people are saying they're best friends. Uh, this one holds true. They are really close friends. And even though he's coming from technically a senator from Oregon, they do know each other going back to Illinois when they were both lawyers uh, coming up in the 1830s and 1840s. And they're up and coming lawyers. They're both getting politically involved with the Whig party. And they actually compete for the Whig nomination for the House of Representatives in the 1840s, which Baker beats Lincoln. And Baker's almost like a carbon San Diego. This guy's everywhere. Um, he's in different countries, in different parts of the cut, you know, it's crazy. So he starts in Illinois. Uh, he's in the House of Representatives, uh, but then he differs from Lincoln in several ways. Uh, one of them is on views of the Mexican War. Uh, Baker resigns his seat, fights in the Mexican War, uh, like a lot of politicians do, comes back to show support for the war by wearing his uniform and tries to generate more support again for the war effort. 
After the war, he once again is in the House of Representatives. Uh, but then in the early 1850s, Baker sought profit in California, like a lot of people do. Uh, he starts a profitable law firm there. Uh, and he tries to get involved in national politics, uh, particularly leaning Republican once the Republican Party uh, becomes more prominent on the national scene. Uh, but he can't really find a clear path to get into national politics in California. Uh, so when Oregon becomes a state in 1859, uh, people within the Republican Party in Oregon basically say, hey, come here. You can be a senator, essentially, uh, as a way to limit the power of the Democratic Party in the new state. Uh, so he moves to Oregon, becomes a senator, and quickly leaves the state to go back to the East Coast uh, to represent them. And he stays friends with Lincoln for, you know, 10 years plus. And when Abraham Lincoln wins the nomination uh, for his inauguration, Baker's with him in the carriage. Um, I wasn't planning on saying this, but side story, the security for that is Charles Stone. And Baker, I think, introduces even Lincoln for the inauguration. And they stay close. Uh, Lincoln's son, Eddie, is named for Edward Baker. Uh, Eddie dies at an early age, but Lincoln's even naming a son after him. And when the war is beginning, Baker wants like, once again to be involved militarily. And he wants to show that California, again, he's a representative now of Oregon, but that California and the West Coast is supporting the Union war effort. So he's advocating, what's your cat's name? This is Fiona. Oh, I thought maybe it was named Ever Baker. Not ever Baker. But Baker wants to show support for the war on the West Coast. So he pitches this idea. He wants to form a California regiment and he wants to be an officer in it. He wants Lincoln to give him a commission. Because of some technicality, for one, he's not ever put in Lincoln's cabinet because they need to hold his seat in the Senate. He's a Republican in the Senate. They know that if he resigns that seat, it's going to go to a Democrat. So he never resigns his seat as a senator, and he is commissioned as a colonel for what's going to, at least in the early stages, become known as the California Regiment. Mm -hmm. However, there's not a whole lot of Californians in it. It's raised in Philadelphia. Uh, so there's a lot of Pennsylvanians within this. They'll eventually become known as the 71st Pennsylvania. I know Travis has a soft spot for the 71st. 72nd is really my jam. Oh, but... OK. Please. <laughs> I apologize. I can't believe I made that mistake. So Baker, again, gets a commission. He is a colonel, and he's in charge of the California Regiment. He is then in this area of Leesburg vicinity, guarding the Potomac River into Maryland, close to the area Dana mentioned about Point of Rocks. And he's under the command of Brigadier General Charles Stone. And in October 1861, again, just a couple months after the disaster at First Manassas, uh, there's a lot of consistent patrolling of the Potomac River. It's a border. You've got to think of it as Union across on the Maryland side, Confederate into the Virginia side. Because of faulty reconnaissance and miscommunication, which happens all the time in the war, but especially in 1861, there's some perception that there's a very vulnerable troop unit that could be attacked for the Confederates, which leads to forces going across uh, for October 21st, 1861. Stone isn't there, but he's given Edward Baker control of the forces in that vicinity. And it's Baker's call when uh, engagement starts during the day on the 21st of October, but whether he should be pulling back troops back over to Harrison's Island in the Potomac or to bring more troops in. And despite a lack of boats to quickly bring troops back and forth, he engages on the 21st. And as the afternoon proceeds, uh, Baker holds his own, but then when the 17th and 18th Mississippi get involved, along with the 8th Virginia, uh, more and more troops basically push the Union soldiers back to the Potomac. And around 4.30 in the afternoon, Edward Baker uh, is shot through the brain and chest. And he dies instantly. And it basically unravels after that point. And if you've never been to Ball's Bluff, there's a lot of steep bluffs right there along the Potomac. Uh, so some soldiers fall over the bluffs. Some do make it down a path that's a little more manageable. Soldiers can't swim. There's reports of soldiers drowning, uh, getting captured. Uh, the casualty rate is way in favor of the Confederates in terms of the battle. Uh, of course, the most notable being Edward Baker, who's in charge of all the troops on that side of the Potomac River. 
Now, Baker, he's, again, the only sitting senator to ever be killed in battle. And it's this, a distinction he'll probably hold forever. As uh, the start of World War II, uh, it was banned for senators and congressmen to hold uh, active duty positions uh, for that purpose of not having someone who's in politics, uh, particularly in the Congress, uh, potentially be killed like he was. Uh, so he'll probably be the only person to hold that distinction going forward. There's funerals in several cities. Uh, he's ultimately buried in San Francisco. Um, but then there's a whole nother phase where you've got Congress who's thinking, all right, what the hell is going on here? We thought this war would be over quickly. You know, the best one hit wonder there could be. Go win the war in the summer of 1861. It doesn't happen. It's an embarrassment. It doesn't end well. It doesn't end well. Uh, you've got blockade fiascos. You've got first Manassas, the most wonderful one. And now you have a very one-sided defeat in Virginia, not far from DC again, and you have a sitting senator who's killed during it. Not to mention that, but there's rumors of materials and even men floating down the Potomac River headed towards Washington. So Congress wants to actually see how this war is being conducted. And what's formed is the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, basically to give oversight. And they do oversight in all sorts of forms from illicit trade uh, to how Union soldiers are being treated in Confederate prison camps, to officers and how battles are conducted, to contracts that are handed out. They run the gamut in terms of what they look at. And when it comes to Ball's Bluff, when they look at it, uh, all eyes point to Charles Stone, who is the Brigadier General in the area. And after supposedly secret you know, meetings that happen, even though they always get leaked, uh, there's interviews that take place. And Charles Stone says, hey, I gave authority to Colonel Baker. He's the one who's in control of whether they're going across the Potomac, they're gonna stay engaged or retreat. Now you never wanna be the person who's blaming the dead guy. And that is, a, there's a lot of examples of that during the war where people basically get saved about through their death in terms of scrutiny. And the Joint Committee of the War is bipartisan, but there is more representation for Republicans and Democrats on it. Uh, so they do view this, even though George McClellan agrees with Charles Stone that Baker was at fault, uh, the Joint Committee finds the fault being with Stone. And they actually arrest him and they send him to a prison meant for Confederate sympathizers. And he's there for six months uh, before he's eventually released. And then he is back in the army demoted. And then he resigns, I think in 1864. I can't remember the exact time he resigns though. And if there's one thing with the Joint Committee, you know, a really wrongdoing, it's hard to find someone who's mistreated more than Charles Stone in this regard. Um, of course, so there are several others. Uh, but when it comes to the Joint Committee, uh, I think they basically just get dismissed as being a nuisance for the war effort. And it's fascinating looking at the ebbs and flows about how they're remembered uh, since the war concludes. And when you look at people like Charles Stone and you know, Fitz John Porter, among others, it's easy to say, well, these are just partisan people. Um, I'll be curious to see if you guys have any opinions on this. I honestly give them a pass though, in terms of as a committee for what they do during the war. They're not simply partisan. Again, they do have significant democratic representation. Uh, they are a thorn in Lincoln's side. Obviously Lincoln's a Republican and you can criticize them for the severity with which they think this war needs to be fought harder in terms of when they wanna do so, but I think they're on the ball in some ways too, at least in the sense, not just a partisan hack committee that gets completely dismissed for their significance during the war, which they do stay in operation. I think they have 272 um, different things that they look at in uh, interviews throughout the war, uh, all the way up to 1865. What do you think, Dana? Is that a hot take here? <laughs> I, I mean, I, well, is, what literature is there on the Joint Committee? Has anybody done a, a good study of, of their actions? And, and I don't think so, right? I haven't seen one that's holistic, like, you know, throughout the war. There are plenty of... Beyond Lincoln's shoulder, which looks at the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. And I think that's the most recent one. And in the 1950s and 60s, you see basically an apology tour for the Radical Republicans basically saying that they are on the same page and reformers. Uh, of course, in the early 1900s at the height of birth of a nation kind of movies, and yeah. they're hammering them as just ridiculous, insane, radical Republicans. Um, it seems to me there's common ground though. While there's obviously mis mischaracters of justice that they do, I don't want those 
instances to cloud as a whole what they're trying to do and how someone like Benjamin Wade, who's a pretty tough Republican from Ohio. Right, that's true. Going to be conducted. They're not just Republicans. They're also on the ball in terms of slavery and a harder war. And people say, well, they're critical of George McClellan. Hell, half the people who know about the Civil War are I mean, easily critical of McClellan. I, I, you, do you think that the specter of that joint committee, though, hampered Union military operations, even if, in fact, they were more non-partial than you say? Yeah, well, that's the thing. They probably, you know, whether they do more harm than good right. is kind of the debate within them. And again, it's hard to really get a judge. Because on one hand, I see them and have a vision that actually is somewhat honest about how they're going to win the war. Mm -hmm. Over time, though, is Abraham Lincoln using them as leverage, saying, we're going to bring you in for questioning in these committees right. if you know you're not following within the harder war mindset that lincoln starts evolving to yeah whether he uses them as a political ploy or whether he finds them a nuisance it's hard to say but um, well here's another question then that often gets basically overlooked um i've got just this is a hypothetical would would the committee have been formed if baker hadn't died not like he's trying to recover but like imagine would there have been, would there have been an excuse, some other tinder that would have inspired the creation of this committee? Or was it really, it's 1861, no one knows what's happening, and so there's this reaction? I think there was something else would have happened. Yeah, there's just, there's just too many inexperienced officers who were politicians, yeah. who were noteworthy before the war. Yeah. You know, there's, you know, there's just, there's too much potential for grievous mistakes like this to happen. Something else was going to go wrong. Yeah, well, something high profile was going to happen. That yeah, would, it, that would initiate this like increased oversight of Lincoln, especially because you know there's there's all this talk about Lincoln taking extraordinary power. Right. That Congress would have acted in some way to check it, re regardless of Baker. But Baker was a very convenient. You know, that's that sounds callous, but was was a useful catalyst for that. I mean, the Battle of Ball's Bluff is a bad enough debacle, Edward Baker aside, you know, yes. to have right. that disparity in casualties, to have it so close to Washington, to have, as Joe said, like bodies, bodies and stuff down the shore. river. Right. Like, this was not a situation that Congress was going to ignore. Well, yeah, it's not that there are shoes here. I mean, they are, you know, 35 miles from these embarrassments and yeah. they mandate to look over this war, I can't really blame them for thinking we need to figure out what is going on with these officers who no. have public right. lawsuits. All right. And yeah. They, and, and yeah, I mean, that's, it, it occurs, of course, as you all know, there's sort of a void of activity, right? You know, and everybody's waiting and all everyone in the North, you know, after first Manassas was a, considered a feat. And then there's this debacle, you know, it just, it's a lightning rod. And I mean, to bring it back into context with what I talked about earlier this evening, this is October of 61 is the height of this kind of blockade fear of yeah. Washington. So, I mean, there's so much right. weighing on everyone's minds in that city. Yeah, that's um, a really, that's a really good point, you know, not to take it in a vacuum and look at it. Of in course. The entire, right, you know, mindset. It's inherently safe. And, you know, again, hindsight is always different. So in their mindset with what they've seen, I, Feel like there's definitely going to be a joint committee in some sorts not just because of baker and drew brought up a question about like, i think it's world war ii where it's i don't think it's congress drew that makes that call i think it's the army that mandates that you can't be a sitting congressman and serve in active duty obviously there's people in reserves that are active duty still today uh, but i believe in the early stages of world war ii it's the military not the congress i'll look into it though and get back to you on that but i'm pretty sure the, the military didn't want Probably the political distraction of having congressmen serve in an active duty while also serving chairs, but also you need a you need a Congress still in session. You can't have too many yes. out of soon too. So probably went from a maybe PR thing, but also a practical standpoint as well. But I'm pretty certain it was the military's call, not congressmen Congresses on that one. But I'll look into it. Um, so while we're talking about you know kind of a, a holistic look about what's going on here in 1861. So perfect branches, we just talked about Paul's Bluff, we talked about this fear that's going on in Washington, we talked about bodies floating down the river. Um, well, one of those bodies just happened to be a second lieutenant from Worcester, Massachusetts, 
by the name of William Grout, known as Willie, Willie Grout. Um, and his, his death and his legacy actually ended up being uh, much larger, I think, than, than the individual himself. So Willie Grout was from Massachusetts. He was the only son, um, but he had three sisters. He was kind of the, you know, a little bit the star of the family, as, as you can imagine, an only son being he's the oldest. Um, he went to a military academy there near his hometown, um, and he, he asked permission to enlist when the Civil War broke out and was at first, you know, told, don't, don't go, don't leave home, but then, you know, but then was, was told by his parents that he could enlist. And between shipping out, between, you know, going to enlist and then shipping out, he practiced by sleeping on the floor of his room. Um, he was someone who was very much a young patriot. He was 18 years old. Um, he was in the bloom of youth, you know, the, all of all of those things that we learn about these young soldiers that are signing up on both sides of the conflict. And so um, he ends up, you know, stationed on the north side of the Potomac River there at the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall. Um, and it ends up at the 15th Massachusetts were some of the first to actually make it across the river in the Battle of Falls Bluff. So of course the river being a major bottleneck to actually get soldiers over, the 15th Mass is in the action most of the day there and they sustain a lot of casualties, over 300 casualties during what is really a small battle. Um, and for, for what we know, what we're able to stitch together about Willie's experience during the battle is we we he's in company D, so he's not in the first wave that's over. Um, but at the end of the day, he's actually helping soldiers to try and make it back across the Potomac. They've they've been driven down the bluffs, they're being pushed back across. Willie comes back, and one of the last encounters we hear is him going to Colonel Devons and saying, Is there any more that I can do for you? Is there any more that I can do for the men? You know, there's 18 year old kid who's coming back, you know, asking to do more. And Devins tells him, um, there's no more that you can do for me. You know, look after the men or look after yourself. Something to that effect is the best that Devins can recollect afterwards. And so Willie goes back down to the river. He's already helped one shuttle get across. He's helping a second shuttle when he is shot mid river coming back across. Um, and he somehow manages to say to one of his comrades, you tell everyone, you know, tell the rest of the men, I would have made it back across, except that I'm shot and now I have to sink, is what he says. Um, which is a lot to get out if you're drowning and have just been shot. But apparently he says these things and he, he dies, he drowns essentially, even though he's been shot. Um, and usually that would be the end of of this story when you when you wash away in a river, but he his body was actually found two weeks later in Washington, DC. So when we're talking about these bodies that are being washed down from the battle, it was a it was a very real phenomenon that happened. And you can imagine, you know, being in DC, as Travis said, you're you're blockaded in, you know, like you don't necessarily know that they're dinky little Confederate whatevers, you know, that are out there. To you, you're blockaded in. There has just been a battle in which the United States lost to another power. And then there are bodies of young uniformed men washing up in your town. And Willie Grout was one of them. Um, and they were able to identify him apparently by letters that were on his person and also his name or his initials were stitched into his clothing. Um, so he was, he had a, um, a, a pretty big funeral procession back there in Massachusetts in Worcester. Colonel Devins was present um, and said a few words and he was interred in the in the local cemetery. Um, but it, it caused a fanfare because this was this was one of their own, you know, that that came home to them. Um, and so you think two weeks after October 21st, so we're in early November by this point, um, a poet, a local resident of Worcester, goes to visit the family, goes to visit Mr. and Mrs. Grout, and he ends up writing a poem about Willie Grout and about his sacrifice, his patriotic sacrifice. And in 1895, when this poet, um, his name is Henry Stevenson Washburn, when he's writing kind of a collection of all his life's works, he names it 
you know, the vacant chair and mm. other poems because the vacant chair is what become what he is becomes best known for. Um, and he gives this retrospective on who Willie Grout was. And he says that according to the family and everybody in the town, you know, he was well loved by his classmates, by the townspeople, by everyone else. He was um, a perfect image of manliness and would have been chosen as an artist's model, you know, is something that, that uh, Washburn is saying. So he's really painting Willie Grout to not just be a neighborhood kid who went to war and died, but he's painting them, him to be this representative figure, you know, of innocence and youth and patriotism that goes and becomes a, a sacrifice for the war effort. And um, the vacant chair really takes on a life of its own. It's, it's published for the first time November 16th, of 1861, and it's just a poem at that point. It's published in broadsides, um, but within a few weeks, George Root, who is um, who's a composer, writes a tune, a melody, to go with this poem, which is a pretty, um, that's par for the course for popular culture music, popular music, parlor music of this time, is that a composer might take a familiar, you know, a familiar um, poem or work with a poet or a lyricist and come up with these, you know, sheaves of music. And The Vacant Chair quickly is published in Chicago, Cincinnati, Boston, Richmond, Savannah, basically anywhere that has publishing, music publishing, is going to end up printing off The Vacant Chair. Um, so by early 1862, and certainly by the fall, there are folios of this music and this poem that Washburn wrote in innumerable households, both in the North and in the South. Um, and one of the things that's also interesting is the idea of the imagery of the vacant chair that becomes ubiquitous throughout the war. And so we can all imagine, you know, just, um, you know, the idea that there's this vacant chair. The family is all gathered around. Maybe it's a holiday, maybe it's every day, and it's Willie's chair that's empty, you know, is the idea. Um, but one thing that I discovered was 20 years before this, in 1840, there was a very popular song called The Old Armchair. Um, and it was it was published in the Americas. They definitely printed it in Boston. Um, and it was actually about a mother's chair. So a mother had died and had left behind this armchair and the song was written from the perspective of the collective family and the children. And here, that idea, the vacant chair is spun around. It's no longer about, you know, the natural course of life, you know, you miss your mother, but of course your mother is going to pass on before you to all of a sudden being about a young man, a son who has passed away and left this chair behind. Um, and that, of course, fits the framework of a lot of Civil War songs that we see being written, being sung, being played throughout the Civil War in parlors, you know, in America. Um, these are songs that would be sung by family members, um, again, at gatherings, holidays, etc. So I thought that was, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and we do have records of this song being sung in the South during the war too. Uh, so for example, um, there was a group of, I forget, there's a group of, of North Carolinians um, and they're in North Carolina, but away from home. And they are staying at this woman's house and they, something that this, this battalion always does is they sing for they sing for their stay, right? They're going to sleep on the floor, but they're going to sing their hostess a song as some kind of thanks. And they choose to sing the vacant chair. Well, what they didn't know is that this poor woman's husband had just died. Um, and so she's just losing it, you know, through, through them singing this song, um, which I think is really telling that she knows this song the men know this song enough to sing it, you know, even though we're only a year and a half or so removed from the song being written in the first place. So the vacant chair really strikes a chord with people, um, regardless, of course, of whether they're North or South or whether they knew Willie Grout or not, you know, it, it becomes this really great symbol of, you know, the use and the sacrifice during the Civil War. 
Did they know, is it, it, when it was used in the South, did they know the backstory or was this just a song that popped up that they resonated with? I think it was mostly a song that popped up that they knew. George Root, who wrote the music for it, wrote many other very popular Civil War tunes. So the Battle Cry of Freedom was written by him, but also um, the Old Swanee, you know, the folks down the river, the Old Swanee, that's a that's a Southern Plantation song. So he had written for minstrel shows before the war. So he was someone that would have been known as like a popular composer. It's interesting to note that in the South, um, Washburn's name, the person who actually wrote the poem, his name was left off or was written in as just initials. So that, that part of the story they were shuffling away. And of course, the only reference directly to Willie is that there's a line in the song that says how how our brave Willie fell, Willie you know, fell, and how yeah. he strove to to carry the banner, et cetera. So all of those terms are loose enough to be used on either side, you know, which I'm sure Washburn didn't intend, but it made it so this song yeah. could be sung and published you know, on, on either side of the border. Of course, with other songs published during the war, you actually see some of the lyrics change, whether it's North or South, but this song didn't seem to, you know, be something they needed to do. I think you touched on something as well, Anne-Marie, because, you know, how old was Willie? Willie was 18. Okay, so, you know, infant mortality obviously claims a lot of young children during the Civil War era, and it had for decades previous to that, you know, but after kids reach a certain age and they're sort of out of that childhood disease range, you know, you think they're fairly safe, right? You know, I don't know exactly what age it is, but, you know, you will- Like by the age of 10 or 12, you usually bank on your kid being- You, you think, oh, thank God, you know, he's made it through all that horror and we didn't lose him, right? And then, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Americans lose their kids after they've yeah. made it through that rigid, that terrible period and they lose them in the war. So this song would have touched the court regardless, whatever side of the line you're on. Yeah, and you know, and there's there's some of it that of course could be spoken to, you know, even if your if your son was simply still away at war. You know, there's still this idea mm, that right. the chair is vacant, even you know, the song goes on more to say that obviously this person gave their life, but this idea of a vacant chair mm -hmm. is obvious to many, if not most families, you know, throughout throughout the country. Yeah, um, and and especially again, an only son who right. perhaps, you know, the family, the parents were hoping to have some later right. life security that even the idea of a male, you know, being being productive professionally, that there's so much potential, you know, being right. lost. Give us something to cheers. Oh, something to cheers. Let me think. Uh, okay, so there's a there's another there's a tall tale associated with Ball's Bluff as well that cannot cannot be corroborated, but is kind of an interesting an interesting thing. Uh, there is a woman named Juanita Velasquez who claims that she fought on the side of the Confederacy during the Battle of Ball's Bluff. Um, and she's originally, I think, from Texas um, and claims to have signed up for the war in Pensacola and then to have somehow made it from there to Virginia and was living in Leesburg before the Battle of Ball's Bluff and ended up commanding a whole company that somehow didn't have any command to it during the battle. Hmm. Um, I know. So again, very tall tale. Um, who, <laughs> what? I don't know. Um, but I thought to at least we should toast to Willie Grout, um, Lamar, the other Stone. You know, all these all these unfortunate casualties of 1861. Well, would you say your story ended well or not? Because Willie drowns, but there's this great song. I, you know, I can't obviously cannot speak for for Willie Grout or for his family, but I would, I would take solace in the knowledge that you know that his death, and through Washburn's song, I think it did comfort a lot of people, and it very, reached a lot of people. So yeah. I'd like to think there's a heartwarming element to that. It's a very, yeah. very sort of haunting song. Yeah, Ralph Stanley. I've been stuck in my head for days song. now. So, yeah. 
Yeah. And I think all these stories show, again, when you think of the Civil War, just don't think of the battles where right. the stories of it are on a humanistic level, but also the day-to-day -day level where these battles are anomalies in a lot of ways. Yes. These aren't happening often. You know, people think 1861, they think the beginning of the war, first Manassas, 1862, you know, every year mm -hmm. is the same thing. But that only tells you how people are viewing the war in a span of hours or a few days. Yes. Well, right. look at how they're dealing this on a day-to-day -day basis and how families back home are they're not just losing people in battles they're losing them to diseases like we talked about two weeks ago right or to these, these skirmishes that can lead to death or to drunken gunfights on a railroad push cart a lot of control on, on the rails yeah uh you know and I, I know you all have been a ball's bluff there's been tremendous uh preservation work done recently on the you know fairly recently in a battlefield what I always find interesting about Ball's Bluff is you could pretty much tell the microcosm of every Civil War battle on that small little battlefield. You know, there's flank attacks, there's failed frontal assaults, there's bad decisions by commanders, there's bad terrain. You know, everything that happens on any Civil War battle, no matter how large, yes. happens at Ball's Bluff. You there's know? good luck, there's bad luck. Yeah, you could tell the story of every battle in that little park above yeah. the Potomac. It's, it's Famous funny. people like Travis, we can talk about Oliver Wonder Holmes that we didn't even get to. Yeah, so, yeah. People and civilian reaction like Anne Marie's talked about. Yeah, the establishment of the National Cemetery System. Yeah. There's that little cemetery there. You know, political generals. It's just, it contains everything in a little, little space. You know, it's really something. Yeah, and I think, you know, to, to piggyback off of that, Dana, I think that often 1861 gets um, gets bulldozed for the bulldozed for the more glamorous battles, I guess, if we could say that. You know, right. the, the the flashy names, the big numbers, um, and a lot of times, you know, 1861 is Fort Sumter, first Manassas, and then right. and then on to the better, you know, the the more right. important. And then, and then Shiloh, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think I think 61 is is really interesting because we don't know how to make war yet. No, I know. You know, on yeah. ourselves, especially, you know, in our own hometowns. Um, and I think it's really interesting. Before we sign off, uh, I should have looked up, but it's that is Route 28. Uh, that oh, runs, okay. Runs out of point of, uh, out of point of rocks. It's sometimes called the Tuscarora Road. Oh, you weren't talking about South Mountain Creamery. You're talking, about, was it Rocky Point Creamery? Rocky Point. Or whatever? I said yeah. South Mountain. My ice cream, ice cream mixed up. Get your ice cream, cream straight. I know, I know. <laughs> But, that place does have great ice cream, though. That's where that little family cemetery okay. plot is. And uh, I don't really want to give away the exact location, but it, it's this amazing cemetery that's obviously been forgotten. And um, But that, it's on Route 28. One other quick mention, along that Route 28 before the Civil War was one of the largest slave auction houses in the region. Wow. was down in that area. So you talk about Southern sympathy in that area and everything. And, you know, there was a slave auction house in Maryland um, down in that, that along that road at some place. I'm not exactly sure where, but I know there was one there. Oh, we could do a whole episode about Point of Rocks. There's a lot of great Mosby stories that happen there, including the Eagle Cake, which is my favorite. So we're going to save cake. that for later. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess if we're going to say something positive, too, on a high note, is that the war does continue for a few more years, which gives us a lot more topics. To oh, okay. Into. I was wondering, because that doesn't sound good, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Good news. 600,000 people died. Good well, news, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, don't, I mean, we did sort of set a theme of it doesn't end well. and it's It making doesn't it really hard. end well. Yeah. It's making it, it really hard end. to turn around at the end and say, oh, here's a positive story. Positive spin. Yeah. Like, positive spin, it doesn't end well. And we can talk more about how it doesn't end well in the next three years either. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Should we do one of these for, for every year of the war? What, is, what does the audience think? I think, I think we, there's enough material. I think I think we should, but we've got to break it up in between, right? So like do 61 and then go back and do some fun, juicy bits. You know, Scandals was a lot of fun last week. I know we've got some others in the hopper um, and then revisit periodically is my vote. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. If, well, I, I'm, I'm a guest, but it sounds good for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Dana, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Oh, uh, hey, I really appreciate you asking me. It was a lot of fun. 
It was a lot of fun. And if you ever do one on Sandy Hook, I think you'll be the go to the go to guy. I think that would just be you and me talking back and forth for an hour, Dana. <laughs> well, we can, it could be Sandy Hook Harper's Ferry because there's so many oddball things. Oh and, my yeah. yeah. Cannot wait. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Do we have any more questions coming in, Joe? No more questions coming in. Just We've just, educated everyone. Really? You uh, stumped us on a couple, but we will get back to you on those and we'll bring him on board to do one of these. No, things. we're going to get we're going to get Drew back for that is what we're going to do. Put, put Drew on and then I'm going to ask like ridiculous questions. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to have like, we need to have a roast of Drew Gruber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just like and share if you would like to see a roast of Drew Gruber. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Maria, we have talked about doing a historical roast, but maybe we'll do a contemporary. Yeah. If you think the joint committee on the conduct of the war yeah. was tough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well all right this has been a lot of fun well thank you all for having me thank you so much for joining us dana i say um next week we do have our topic picked out we're going to be talking about uh myth and history and how the two kind of blend together and our guest star uh for next week is a, a good friend of mine longtime friend um, that's Dr. Jeff Tolbert, who is a professor of folklore and American studies at Penn State Harrisburg. So it ought to be really weird. We're going to go everything from kind of ghosts, legends, ghosts uh, to weird ghost stories, to whatever. Um, yeah, ghosts, myths, be, legends, folklore. It'll be a good one. It's going to be different. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. All right, everybody. So join join back in um, next week at seven. Joe, any final plugs for stuff going on at the Loud Museum? No, we do have a blog that we go up every week, and tomorrow uh, we're going to post one. We're going to try to collect people's perceptions of what's going on in their lives right now. So we're working on getting that up and running as soon as possible. But we want to become a repository to hold on to people's pictures that they see around the area, uh, what they're feeling. I know some people are keeping diaries and journals. Uh, so we're going to try to kind of compile some of that so we can really remember and hone on kind of this moment in time for future future generations. Um, thanks, everyone who is still tuning in. I encourage you guys, um, please give us a shout, um, send us a donation, join, become a member of the Mosby Heritage Area, become a member of the Loud Museum, buy a subscription to Civil War Times. Um, think of your think of your historians during this time um, and have a good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>